see you then. Thank you, Brother John. God has been so gracious to me over the years in so many ways. As you know, brothers and sisters, many of you can bear witness, the greatest privilege in life is to follow Jesus Christ. Amen. And the greatest joy of life is to sense that somehow by His grace, we are allowing Him to minister through us. And the power of the Holy Spirit and the love and the tenderness and gentleness of Jesus Christ. And our brother John and our sister Vera May uh, personify that. And one of the great joys of my 98 years in the ministry was the uh, uh, eight plus years that I had the privilege of partnering with John and Vera May. And most recently, just in the last three weeks, I've been down to Jackson and the vision John shared this morning in his, uh, in his uh, Bible study is one that I've seen uh, firsthand. Uh, the tremendous potential for that vision. Friends, I've been in the ministry now for a lot of years and I've known many young men and young women who have received a vision from their father or grandfather or mother or pastor. Never have I seen a man who God has used so significantly, a man and a woman, who uh, have fulfilled the vision, who are at the place of life in which they can move into the comfort zone, who have received the vision of their son. Spencer, and how God has used him now to plant that new vision for the rest of their lives and the rest of their ministry. It is a great joy. My reason for being here tonight is to uh, bring uh, greetings to you from brothers and sisters in the Mission America movement and to invite all of you to be involved. We're so grateful for what God is doing. I've been wanting to come to one of these conferences for years and um, had the privilege of arriving late yesterday, was here last night for that wonderful evening and all day today. It's been a wonderful day. And I, the great joy, uh, how many of you uh, I've met before and have had the privilege of sharing and fellowshipping with. But Mission America, just very briefly to give glory to God, and Jarvis Ward shared with you yesterday morning, and I will not repeat, except John asked me just to highlight a couple things. Mission America is a coalition now of 349 Christian leaders in the United States. As far as we know, never before in the history of the church, 65 denominations that have officially voted to be involved. Nearly 200 ministries now involved, focusing on united, we don't even use the word cooperative anymore, it's too shallow in the American church, collaborative, prayer, focusing on revival and evangelism. The mission is simple. It is a big vision. It fulfills what God has called you to do and what God has called you to be in every ministry represented here and in the CCDA. It is the vision of praying for by name every man, woman, young person, and child in America. This movement is come out of the U.S. Lausanne Committee when we returned from International Congress in Manila, Philippines in 1989. We asked, what does the Lord want us to do the last decade of this century? Now, I always be grateful we didn't have a phrase for it then. I now have coined a little phrase. Always be grateful we decided we would do it the Jesus way instead of the American way. The American way is we had about two dozen Christian leaders who could have put some plan together in about three hours, asked God to bless it and announce it to America. We decided we'd spend a year on our knees before God in prayer and come back and ask God, Lord, what do you want us to do? And it was one of the subsequent discussions that two things came very clearly into focus that God was doing. Number one, he was initiating a prayer movement. This was in the early 90s. He was initiating prayer movement from many, many, many different streams, tributaries. And secondly, he was calling the church back into American cities. Those were the two things that came very clearly to us in 1991 and that he was calling us to serve the body of Christ and calling us back to the basics to humble ourselves and to seek God and to stop being the consumer church and to start sharing his love and grace. And so the simple, we were having a discussion in about 1992 about gang warfare. They were, the gang 
uh, warfare stories were on the front pages of all our newspapers and news magazines. And the Lord prompted me to say, wouldn't it be wonderful if we knew the name of every gang member in America and we could begin to pray for them by name? And then others said, what about the children of America? What about the senior citizens of America? What about the minorities of America? What about the poor of America? He said, there isn't anyone that shouldn't be prayed for. And secondly, and this fits so well into the vision shared last night that God gave Spencer, that we would share, we would pray, and then incarnationally become Jesus Christ to these people to allow Jesus to minister through us and to share his love and grace with every person in America in an appropriate and loving way, not dumping the gospel on people verbally that are not ready to receive it, but incarnating the gospel of Jesus Christ to pray for and to share God's love and grace with every person in America by year end 2000. That is a stupid dream, unless it's of God. And we believe it's of God. And we are praying that the church in Christ, of Christ will be mobilized to fulfill the dreams and the visions that God has given you. We rejoice and we give God thanks. Friends, there's a wonderful thing God is doing today. And this conference is an incredible demonstration of it. The prayer that our Lord Jesus prayed for us in John 17, it was referred to this morning. The Lord is calling us back to himself and calling us together. It is time for us to come together to pray and to share the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Thank you for letting me be here. It's a great joy. And now, because I'm here, I am now a member. I'm no longer just a visitor. I am now a member and look forward to sharing with you in the days ahead. Thank you. God bless you. Well, I'm going to make this introduction a little bit shorter. They, they, they start putting these signs up on me out there uh, with a long introduction with, uh, with, uh, with, with Paul. But this is a real privilege and a pleasure for me to introduce the person I'm thinking to introduce now because her husband, Lim Tucker, who replaced me as the head of the Voice Calvary Ministry in Jackson, who had this vision together, and really, Lim would have been the first president of this movement, but suddenly God took Lamb home to be with him, and then of course Eleanor uh, went back to her home in um, in um, Virginia, and uh, of course since then God has uh, given her a husband and two beautiful children, and uh, and given her ministry, and now this is her first time being with us, and it's just such a real privilege for me to uh, invite back you know, representing the continuous of the work that her husband uh, helped to lay the foundation for. And that she's joining back with us. And that she has something to say to us about some new materials that's going to be used in terms of our schools and our centers around the country. Uh, so would you all welcome, uh, really for the first time, uh, uh, Eleanor Tucker Realm to speak to us. Thank you so much for that introduction, John. I appreciate it. Greetings to all of you in the name of our Lord Jesus. It is indeed a very, very special privilege to be here with you this evening. I remember 19 years ago when Lim would ask me to go with him to various churches around the country for a CCW workshop, that was, and there would be maybe three or four people there in a room in a very big church. And I used to say, my goodness, Lord, what is this all about? We only have three or four here. And the only word that I got back was, no matter. It's the gifted and committed few. And so it's a real exciting blessing to see 2,000 strong here tonight. And I thank you for graciously receiving me. God tells us to love knowledge. He tells us to seek wisdom and understanding. 
A wise man is strong, and a man of knowledge increases power, according to the Proverbs 24.5. So how is one supposed to gain knowledge? Well, how about a basic, simple skill, the ability to read? Do you know that in this country, 44 million Americans, 16 and older, cannot read that scripture? 400,000 to 1 million high school seniors graduate functionally illiterate every year in this country. When we say functionally illiterate, basically what we're saying is people who read on a first or second grade level. We add 2.2 million Americans to the illiterate rolls each year. Illiteracy costs the United States of America, America's businesses, $225 billion a year in lost productivity. Where I'm from, in Mobile, Alabama, Bell South is one of our companies. Two years ago, they could interview 10 people and expect to get one good candidate. That was two years ago. Today, they interview 200 people and they get possibly six good candidates. The reason that they state, people cannot read. It cost us taxpayers $5 billion in compensation. And it costs millions more in terms of prisons filled with men and women, 80% of whom cannot read above the first and second grade level. Only 25% of our nation's fourth graders read at a level of proficiency. That leaves 75% of others falling through the cracks. They are powerless. The reading problems are worst in large metro areas with high minority population figures. And just three weeks ago, there was a national story released in which they said the reason that we have these horrible low reading scores is due to the blacks who cannot read. I think that's kind of dangerous when we start labeling one group of people like that when it really is a mixture of many. And it has nothing to do with race. It has nothing to do with socioeconomic position. In fact, one evening I was having dinner and I sat next to the chairman of the Mobile Area Education Foundation. He is a high-powered attorney in our city. And he said to me, Eleanor, we got your videotape letter of fun for our six-year-old daughter. She was having reading problems, but she doesn't have any reading problems anymore. So it crosses everything and everyone. I didn't want my children to have a problem with reading. I was in school and had the pleasure of learning how to read with phonics. It only went up until the third grade. But as a person from a television news background of writing and reading and speaking for a living, certainly I thought I was quite capable in teaching my children how to read and read phonetically. But when my three-year-old daughter came home one day telling me the sounds of L and X, I thought she was wrong. So I met with her teacher only to find out that her teacher said, you have a problem, lady, and you are the one who needs some help. Your daughter is doing just well. So I said, okay, tell me something that I could have. What would be a good product to use to help me, help my daughter? And she named some of the things that we already had in our home. And I said, no, I'm looking for something a little bit more direct, um, to the point. The attention span of a child that age is two to five minutes, so I want something short to the point. I don't need a whole lot of stuff in between. We want to get on with learning. She said, well, I, I haven't seen what you're talking about. I don't really think that exists on the market. I went to the store and bought something anyway, and when I got home and tested it out, I was most disappointed. And my husband said, listen, you can't find what you're looking for. You can't come in here fussing about it. I forbid it. So get on with creating what it is that you're looking for. I went back to the teacher because I didn't want to create what I was looking for. And I said,
said, please tell me there's got to be something else. She said, well, no, and you know we have another problem, too. We have three-year-olds who don't come back to school. You see, their parents spank them really terribly for not learning fast enough, so they don't come back. Now, I had heard about people spanking children who were not doing well in athletics at an older age, and maybe even at an older age for academics, but not three-year-olds. And that's what really broke me and made me go and talk to the father and say, well, help me. Let me try this. And so I wrote this thing called Letter Fun. And then God blessed it. And it won a National Prestigious Award. It won the 1998 Parents' Choice Video Recommendation, and we thank God for that. But the letters that came back in, thank you. The letters that came back in were so wonderful. There were teachers and principals and parents saying, this works, and it's not just for infants to first grade. We're using it on third graders and 17-year-olds in our ninth grade classes reading on a second grade level. And we've had high school students to come to our home and to thank us. It's really been a blessing, and it certainly has become a ministry. So you say, well, what is in this letter fund? Well, what we did, we took two eight-year-old teachers with their three- and four-year-old students, and we allowed them to help everybody learn the alphabet phonetically, consonants phonetically, long and short vowels phonetically. And I noticed that, you know, we have Smokey the Bear as a mascot, and we have Mr. McGriff for the crime dog. But I kept looking for the education mascot, and I couldn't find one. So we created one education mascot, Buddy Bear, and his trademark is almost ready now. But the thing of it is, we really need to stress education more. If you look at your newspaper, you'll see categories for news, sports, entertainment, and a new one called Weird News. But a lot of times you won't find a special category called education. I encourage you to challenge your newspapers to start including that. We need good teachers in this country, and we need to pay them properly for their work. They set the foundation in this nation for all of us. And we taxpayers are having to pay for our teachers, whether we have our children in public school or not. So we should stand up and demand excellence. I was talking about how Litter Fun works. Funny little story, there was this mother who bought the video and she um, came back, she said, Mrs. Reynolds, we got it for a four-year-old and our 19-month-old. She said, but I have to tell you this, my, my husband came running to me and he said, honey, you better go check on those children, they have a breathing problem. And she said, a breathing problem? She, he said, yeah, go in the family room, they're breathing really strangely. So she went in there and she kept hearing all this noise. Ah, ah, ah. And she fell out on the floor laughing. She said, honey, they're not having a breathing problem. They're just practicing their phonics. <laughs> so it was a situation where he was learning his phonics for the first time. <laughs> really wanted to come before you because I see you as God's guerrilla force. You know you're in the trenches and you know what's really going on firsthand. The statistics that I read aren't statistics to you. They're flesh and blood. Souls. You know the needs of the people. We would like to offer an opportunity for you to be able to become part of our army as well, of helping to remedy the reading crisis that we do have in this country. And we offer it in a way in which you basically can become distributors and you can generate funds for the ministry that God has given you and blessed you with, while helping to raise the literacy level of those within your own community. We hope that you would consider this. Voice of Calvary and Mendenhall Ministries have become some of our ministry distributors, and we praise God for them. 
In fact, Voice of Calvary's 15-month-old Caleb sold three letter fun videos today. <laughs> His mom, Christy, told me about that. And I had the great pleasure of watching him watch the video, and it was amazing to see how already he is trying to phonetically say his letters. A wise man is strong, and a man of knowledge increases power. Let's help some folks be able to read and do that on their own to become powerful. Revelations 1.3 says, Blessed is he who reads, and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. We at Fun Stuff Productions say, tomorrow's leaders are today's readers. Let's give the children we work with a fantastic bright start in becoming the great Christian leaders of tomorrow. Thank you and may God bless you all.